भाई चंदन जी
Adam. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon. Hi, 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 ma good afternoon, Shwarya, ma'am. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon, Shwali, ma'am. Good afternoon. How are you, ma'am? Good afternoon, Nidhi, ma'am. Very good afternoon. Uh, Hello, everyone. All good, good afternoon, good. everybody. Thank you so much for, for joining us uh, on this uh, highly significant day, ma'am, taking out your precious time. Most welcome. Thank you for having us. Our pleasure, pleasure ma'am.
क्लासरूम शिप्रा मैम आई शिप्रा मैम गुड आफ्टरनून Your voice is not audible. Let me figure out something else. <laughs> Challenges of technology. Give me a minute, everyone. No, it's not I, audible. I can hear you, Ms. Vala. Okay, okay, wonderful. Uh, good morning, everyone. Very good, good morning. morning. And happy Women's Day. Thank you. Same to you. Uh, so, I just wanted to know you. Are all comfortable with the questions that I had sent pretty late in the day yesterday? Yeah, yeah, they're pretty fine. Good to go. Okay, perfect. So um, I was suggesting what we're going to do is uh, we'll probably uh, we just welcome all of you and set some context and then hand the mic over uh, to um, you know you all to probably have your say, share your views. Uh, and then maybe I sent uh, two questions uh, to each of you. So maybe we can start with one and go around Robin and then looking at the time, use the second and go around Robin. Is that comfortable with everyone? That's okay. That's fine. Uh, Ashwarya, you pronounce your name as Ashwarya or Aswarya? It's Ashwarya only. It's just a funky spelling my parents kept because of some numerology. Yeah. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. That's no issue. I just wanted to not say it wrong, uh, you know, on the screen. That's why. Thanks, Varya. All right. Perfect. Uh, so, um, Taneja ji, let us know when we have to start. I think we still have about four minutes, right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we have four minutes in hand and um, we'll start sharp 12.30, ma'am. So are you going to start before my start or am I going to start? Uh, Basically, ma'am, uh, the IT team is going to to uh, to announce that it, it is going to be the session going to be live. So then okay. we will start. Then I will start. Okay, fine. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Anjali still has to join, right? Taneja ji? Yes, ma'am. Anjali Singh still has to join. I can't see her on the screen. Anjali ma'am is there. Oh, now I see her. Okay. Okay. Anjali ma'am is there. Ishwari is also here, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see Anjali now. I see her as the icon and not the video. So I got a bit. Oh. Okay. Um, so, ma'am, uh, uh, in two minutes, uh, I'll just ask my IT team to, to go at sharp 12.30, ma'am. I'll just uh, convey the message to the IT.
Uh, Anjali, ma'am, we request you to please uh, switch on your, your camera and uh, unmute, ma'am. Sandarji, can we go live? Uh, yes, Anupji, uh, please go live. Uh, within 10 seconds, we go live. Arya, please live. He was also professor of medicine. We are live, ma'am. Go ahead. Head of medical division. Good morning, everyone. Let me welcome you all to ASOCHAMS International Women's Day 2022 webinar on the theme, Women in Workplace. My name is Shipra Bhalla Chaudhary and I'm the Director for Government Affairs at SAP India. Let me also warmly welcome my distinguished set of co-panelists from a wide variety of sectoral representations, including financial, technology, capital, and even training and development. Happy to have you, Anjali Singh, Managing Director and Head, India Operations, Deutsche Bank, Shifali Mohapatra, Chief People Officer, Atria Convergence Technologies Limited, Ashwarya Ravi, Chief Financial Officer, Kinara Capital, and Nidhi Agrawal, Founder and Director, the School of Unlearning. Thank you very much for joining me today. With such a diverse and accomplished group, we look forward to having a holistic coverage to the team of today. Let me first begin by asking why this topic of women in workplace is such an important dialogue, not only today, but as a recurring theme across the workforce all across the globe. Companies today are pushing for greater gender diversity as they compete for a talent in the competitive market. As digitization has triggered by pandemic, reshapes the contours of professional and personal lives. However, some of the glaring realities continue to stare at us, jumping right at us from research reports and surveys and newspapers and magazines. As a country, India fell 28 places in the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Report 2021. Our overall female labor force participation has been hovering a little or only around 20% for several decades now. We are way behind many, many other nations, even in our urban workforce. As for sectors, ITITS still leads the way by employing uh, about 1.8 million women, almost 36% of total workforce. There continues to be structural barriers in uh, you know, sectors like life sciences, with only 13% of scientists and science faculty in women in higher education and research. The FMCG and FMCD industry also suffers on account of low women participation due to environmental issues, such as work on the factory floor with heavy machinery or the general ergonomics in manufacturing plants. In BFSI, a popular sector for women, women are still underrepresented at all levels of the global financial system. There is only a 27, uh, sorry, 24% con uh, concurrent gender diversity ratio, even in this sector. Well, who stands a chance with traditional industries like telecom, automotive, energy, see even lesser and lesser representation of women in workforce. The pandemic itself has seen disproportionate number of women dropping out of workforce owing to caregiving responsibilities and other personal challenges. Despite the flexi work, even women job seekers has fallen by 34% as per uh, a CMIE report. And even in the workforce, even when we are there, there will be just seven out of 100 women who make it to senior management and five out of 100 in top leadership. 
Now begs the question on what is being done to change all these statistics. We have seen enough companies in promoting diversity and inclusion. And while we say that execution is more important than speech, we do see the changes on ground floor. With my esteemed panelists here, let us discuss how the scenario is changing. Over to you, Anjali. Okay, can you hear me? I'm sorry, I've had some challenges in uh, you know joining. So first of all, I'd like to say that it's it's a much better time for women in corporate life than it was when I started my career, which is almost uh, 27, 28 years ago. So when I think of you know what what all has changed in the world, a lot of positive things have happened. So today, when I meet you know young women, I think the whole awareness of uh, gender diversity, of the value that women bring to the workplace is huge. And so every company, every organization at a government level, at a, you know, a, a, at a social level, a, at a corporate level is trying to stay mindful of the fact that they have to have more, you know, inclusivity with women, which is great. There's a lot of conferences, there's a lot of noise, International Women's Day and this whole month becomes, you know, a plethora of activities around this space. But unfortunately, here's the bad news. I don't think that the numbers are stacking up in proportion to the amount of effort and noise that's being made in this space. And sadly, more so in India, because we all know that women in the workplace is actually decreasing in India. So if you look at the trend over the last seven, eight years, the women in workplace has gone down and you can pull the numbers from the Deloitte reports, from the you know, uh, World Economic Forum reports, but it's significant. So we really have to ask ourselves, despite all the conversation, despite all the effort that a lot of companies are putting in, despite uh, you know, moments like this where we sit down to discuss this, what is not working and what do we need to change for women in India, for it to truly become something that not just is a conversation, but reflects in the output and reflects in women being in the workforce and women being more importantly in leadership positions in the workforce. Because I can you know, give you an example of our bank. Our bank overall diversity for women is 45%, which is awesome. And the reason it has reached there is because there's been such focused hiring done for gender in the past two to three years. However, now how do we groom these women to become our future leaders? Because at leadership levels, we still have work to do. And I think that's the next focus of what we need to do to change. It has four pillars it stands on. I think gender diversity, and I've worked in this space so much that I actually created this uh, pitch some years ago. It stands on the pillar which starts with family, right? So your whole stereotyping starts in the first five, seven years of your life. And therefore, family and society and the stereotypes get defined there. And those two are very, very important components of how we can make this change. And then the third one really is corporate and education, where more than enough is being done. Companies are creating policies which can help women, are trying to see how they get women to stay in the workforce, retain women, bring back you know, women who've had babies and all of the rest. And the last one is policy. So at a government level, at a state level, what are we going to define that helps women come back into the workforce, that helps women stay in the workforce, and that helps women succeed in the workforce? So out of all of these that I've named, the most challenging is the first two, right? It's right there in your psyche, in your stereotype, in how you bring up your daughters versus your sons. A lot of us are bringing up our daughters fabulously now, and I give this example. How many of us are telling our sons it's okay if you become a home husband because your wife needs to follow a career. Probably none of us if we put our hands on our heart, right? I have a son, he's now 23 years old. I'm, I'm more than happy and I see a lot of equality happening between him and you know, his generation, the w men and women. But I'm not sure if I've ever said to him, Karan, I'd be fine if you're a home husband. So, you know, there is a huge stereotype that has to break through. The policy and the corporate guidelines and the policies uh, around women are happening much more and that's all the conversation that's going on but stereotypes and the culture is taking much longer to change sorry thank you so much excellent well said anjali i think your four pillar approach is is exactly what 
what we also talk about, maybe not in the pillar way. I am I am a mother myself to two boys, and uh, so many times I have to uh, break my own, you know, uh, you know, subconscious bias to try and mold my behavior, which is different from the way I was brought up to teach them that you know equality is not something that is 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 to be talked about in a textbook it's something that is demonstrated every day in in action over to you shafali would love to uh, hear your views um first of all thanks a lot for having me here and uh, very good insights from you shipra and anjali uh, i'm also extremely happy that we are acknowledging and having these conversations around uh, gender gap um because it's a fact that uh, women don't have even today, they don't have the same privileges as men. Uh, in fact, the lack of privilege is just so deep that sometimes we don't even realize it, right? Uh, when we are born, we are learning from our caregivers and our family and that boys and girls have different roles. And a child is actually not born with these uh, prejudices, uh, this way of thinking. The child is learning. Uh, we are, of course, you know, as men and women, we are, of course, different biologically. Uh, man definitely can't have birth. Uh, and a man doesn't go through the bodily changes a woman goes through throughout her life. Um, but uh, I think it's time to question why should that make a woman any less capable than a man? And uh, I'm sorry for a little bit of an inflammatory uh, way of asking these questions, but why is the role of the man glorified so much? Uh, I mean, if you just take a look around, even if you take a look at family businesses, uh, generationally it gets passed on to the sons. Even some of the names of the companies have and sons, um, you know, and the, the, this, this is patriarchy, which is so deeply entrenched in the society. So much, you know, it's, it's so deeply entrenched in our psyche that we are not even uh, conscious of it. Uh, you know, some of the other things that uh, make me wonder is why should a woman be seen as dependent, even if a woman is choosing to be um, working from, uh, even if the woman chooses to be a homemaker. Time and time again, the word inferiority is implicitly associated with uh, women. But it, we have seen it over and over that despite all the challenges, despite the biological differences, despite the societal challenges, women have been able to do a lot of things, almost you know, at an equal, if not more than men. So I think these uh, prejudices are so strong that change uh, itself becomes uh, very difficult because subconsciously, the system around and very well said by Anjali, I don't think it's an individual problem, I think it's a systemic issue that we need to, uh, you know, we, we need to obviously think at a much, much larger level because as we grow uh, the systems, the institutions that we belong to, the society that we belong to keeps on reaffirming this biases and even we as women, we tend to fall prey to it um, because a big bulk of uh, women population, you know, we fall out of our careers because of different uh, events at uh, you know life stages, say at a marriage, when we, when people get married, because there is an expectation for the woman to take care of uh, the home front. Uh, women fall um, out of their careers, and this is something that I have constantly witnessed after they uh, reach the stage of parenthood. Again, it's an expectation of the family and the society. I think it's a great decision if it is our own decision. It's not such a great decision if it is if it is um, made be because it is expected of us. Uh, very rightly said, how many men actually give up their careers to raise children? I mean, I can just go on and on, but let me stop here. I think uh, the point I'm trying to make is we as women, we live with uh, discrimination on a day to day basis. And sometimes we don't even realize it. Sometimes we are actually quite OK with it. Um, we have, of course, made immense progress. You know, if I compare, uh, you know, 10 years back, the kind of conversations we were having to the kind of conversations we're having now for both working women as well as home homemakers, uh, I think it's amazing. And it's, 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 it's very heartening. And I think one of the things that has really brought a huge amount of change is the, um, the fact that we now belong to a connected world, right? Because 
individual voices don't have so much power but uh, when we are a collective it has a much uh, you know significant uh, uh, power to it so i think social media and the fact that now the entire globe comes together i think a lot has happened and a lot of progress has happened but despite that i feel that we have barely scratched the surface when it uh, comes to equality and when i say equality i mean equality in spirit um the fact that we are celebrating you know things like women's day it's a great thing but is it enough of course not and uh, but these these are these are pauses we need to take in order to start thinking and uh, look around and we need to become more aware that, that there is discrimination at a systemic level um, in our country and not only in our country across the world and we have to change it um, corporate india needs to lead the way um, but what is taught in schools matter uh, the real change, of course, has to happen at a family unit level because um, that is where the, you know, the conceptualization, the crystallization of mindsets uh, tends to happen and the birth of prejudices actually takes place. But then it um, needs to be worked at, uh, you know, at an education level, what we teach our children and, of course, uh, what happens in organizations. Diversity is important and um, there, there is no question about it because uh it's it's important because when you have a representation of a particular gender all the policies and the practices and the procedures in an organization um tend to be from the majority's perspective and i think this that is something that uh, we have to challenge uh, because uh, uh it's it's something that uh, you know it's it's really not good enough to talk only about equality i think we have to truly believe in it and um, more importantly, we need to act on it. Thank you, Shipali. After listening to you, I, I'm reminded of uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, women leaders, uh, Sheryl Sandberg. I think she once said that, give me a world where half our homes are run by men and half our institutions are run by women. That way, I'm pretty sure that that would be a better world, right? Um, uh, let me let let me go over um, uh, to Ashwarya uh, for her views. Yeah, thank you, everyone, and uh, uh, a happy Women's Day to all of us uh, here today. But uh, the fact that we are celebrating Women's Day also irks me sometimes because that reminds me that we have still a very long way to go uh, in terms of getting that equality between all genders. Uh, I'm a CFO of uh, Kinara Capital, it's an NBFC, and uh, less than 4% of uh, women have reached the CFO status in a financial services company. And that again reminds me of the fact that uh, I was given the opportunity, I was given the ability at the right time, and I was, I was also given all of the uh, mental guidance both from the family level, the school level, and my peer group level, so that that enabled me to get to this point. But there are so many brilliant women out there who are still struggling to find that right news, that right picking point, which can enable them to go all the way up, and which is what is my uh, pet passion. I want to mentor more women who can get to that level uh, we need to get to them at a very early stage from the school level, from the familial level, so that they get ingrained that uh, women can do both. They can do multitasking. They are wonderful at multitasking is what I would say, because all of us are living proofs that we're able to multitask both at uh, uh, the familial level, the uh, professional level as well. And I think we have it in us to go all the way out. But I think culturally there is a bias, uh, both uh, Anjali and Shefali alluded to it, that there is the stigma, there is a socioeconomic concept which is come in, wherein uh, women are always sort of, you know, uh, looked at in terms of a homemaker, home economics, taking care of the family, etc. I think that's the bias, real bias we need to break in. We can do both. We are able to do both, happy to do both actually. So it's not just that we are landed with the job of taking care of the home. I love taking care of my home. I have a daughter, I have a family. I love doing that. I love doing my professional job, uh, being the, at the hem of an NBFC through all of these crises. 
It's been the most challenging period of uh, my life and I've enjoyed both. But having said that, I had the right support both at the home front and at the office front. Uh, we are led by a women majority management at Kinara Capital. My CEO founder is a woman. So from the top down, the type of ethos, the type of cultural inclusivity which flows in is tremendous. I was happy to hear that 45% uh, of Deutsche Bank is uh, women, women focused. The same type of principles we also follow. So about 30-35% uh, uh, is uh, women focused at Kinara Capital. And we have tried to build a inclusive organization wherein there is always merit-based approach. So it's not about being male or female. It's if you have the right passion, right attitude, and the right skill set, you're right for the job. There is no two ways about it. And that's the kind of culture we are trying to build in. Uh, in my opinion, I think there needs to be micro changes for a great movement to happen. And I think at every level, if we try to build in that micro change of inclusivity, of trying to bring back the women an equal opportunity, which is all we ever ask for, uh, I think we all together can go a long way in trying to bridge this gap, which is existent in, in today's society. Fantastic, Ashwarya. It's it's really heartening to know that you're a women-led and women-heavy organization. Yeah. You know, and all of you uh, have spoken about uh, you know uh, the the bias, you know, the subconscious and conscious bias, and which also brings me to our next uh, very interesting speaker uh, from the school of unlearning. It's it's nicely, uh, you know, coined as a um, soul. Right, Nidhi, uh, why don't you talk us through uh, the work that you do uh, in this particular area? Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Nidhi Agrawal from Seoul School of Unlearning. It's my personal honor and privilege to be a part of ASOCHAM's prestigious event, talking on my favorite topic of women power. Firstly, I would like to greet our Sutradhar, Ms. Shilpa Bhalla. Thank you very much, ma'am, and all my co-panelists, Ms. Anjali, Ms. Shefali, and Ms. Ashwarya. I loved your views, very interesting inputs you have shared, and uh, they'll help me build uh, my own different views about the whole topic. I'd like to share my opinion here and bring it to the table. Seoul School of Unlearning uh, is the embodiment of a long held dream. We had experienced in the corporate world that the challenges faced by people have their deep seated root in the subconscious mind their mindset, the outlook, uh, the attitudes, even the prejudices that they bring to the workspace cannot be truly corrected by pure management training. The um, approach of the management wisdom is usually for the conscious mind. It reaches just the mind, but it never reaches their heart. Now we all know that the subconscious mind is a reservoir of vast potential access it is jointly from the mind and the heart but that path is usually clogged with uh, preset notions uh, judgments conditioning of society arising out of our life experience and lack of true education i am a strong advocate of educating people at the school and college level they must be sensitized towards compassion and equality equality in all spheres not just gender equality we have to encourage people to have a rich inner life. You know, it's like uh, controlling their tangent when they step out in the real world. If they start well early enough, then they will not deviate too far later. My take on women's progress is simple and logical. Women are half the humanity on this planet. Okay? They are one of the two wheels uh, on which the society runs. Now, a society cannot run a one-legged race, right? Sooner or later, the turning wheel of life goes uh, out of balance if both the counterweights are not balanced. So our idea is to balance the two. Women do not have to become better than men. They have to become better than themselves. A lot is often discussed in the political and the corporate arena about uh, empowering women. We've done this talk ever since independence. But if we are still talking about the same thing, it is clear that we've not done enough. 
and this issue is not only in india but all over the world in varying degrees so first of all we need to understand that the world was not created equal we have coined um, newer terms and ways such as uh, intersectionality and allyship god is not bound to bow down to a human construct called equality it was never intended to be equal for men and women men and men and even women and women each one of us has to climb up the ladder of evolution irrespective of whether we are a male or a female all that is required is equal opportunity but now why is that one of the wheel is running slower than the other uh, is this the reason why humanity is still going in circles women have been evidently kept behind whether it is in uh, jobs or uh, society rules rituals temples even in parliaments and the feminists have been crying foul for decades citing differences of salary lack of education household discrimination uh, between brothers and sisters domestic violence subjugation oppression and pure exploitation you know uh, the word empowerment somehow it seems very synthetic to me as if it has been done artificially by the favor of someone else i say uh, why not just remove women's hurdles they are powerful enough to rise organically in this time and age uh, humans are not hunters and gatherers we do not have to run or climb trees or hunt down beasts in the forest that we need you know masculine strength the world is pretty much the same for everyone all that needs to be done is let us be just don't block our path while we walk up the mountain of evolution the soul is anyway genderless you know it is our identification with this body that makes it male or female i maintain that a woman is created superior why due to the kind of work god entrusted to her she is able to do diametrically opposite tasks with ease she is a creator she she is a nurturer a guarding angel to her offsprings and even a warrior it need be a man makes a house but a woman makes it into a home i would however acknowledge that men on the other hand like um, uh, ms anjali had very rightly said that you know we we do not uh, tell our boys that it's okay if you want to be a home husband yes the, our men they have the utmost compulsion to be successful and financially viable they rarely have a choice to be a homemaker and not earn women do have the luxury if they choose not to work i would like to conclude by saying when you educate a man you educate an individual but when you educate a woman you educate a clan thank you thank you thanks a lot nidhi it's a very very interesting uh, uh, and diverse perspective to all that we've been discussing in the last maybe 20 25 minutes um let me also uh, bring you all to more focused uh, you know questions re regarding your industry or your personal experience within your organizations um anjali let me start by asking you that you know generally the banking sector has traditionally been popular for women participation in the workforce right what are you or your views on how to take this forward in promoting more and more diversity and inclusion and taking it probably to the next level how do you see this particular banking experience um, get replicated elsewhere so i think uh, you know that's an interesting perspective sometimes because uh, in the past 20 odd years i would think in banking especially in certain in certain banks in india uh, we were lucky there were some very strong male sponsors actually who started uh, you know allying and sponsoring and supporting women and therefore i do think that there was a whole group of you know outstanding women who came to the forefront and have been very strong leaders in the banking world unfortunately it's not as if if you scratch every bank you're looking at their leadership you know statistics at 35 40% which is where we like them to be ideally at 50% but there have become some very very strong role models in banking thanks to what started about 25 30 years ago icici is a great example of that right 
and even in um, even in uh, bank bank cam Merrill. So if there's a lot if there's a lot of different uh, you know financial institutes in India that had some women really shine, and so those women became role models or icons, and therefore banking sort of has a sheen that there are a lot of women at top positions, and that's wonderful to see. It's I do want to say in banking in Deutsche Bank today, there are three MDs in operations. I had that's what I had. I had operations. All three are women, and so again, a statistic to be super super proud of, right? That you've got three women at the helm of operations for Deutsche Bank, and uh, that there are three MD positions, and all are women. Is that the case all the time? And is that the case because um, the women were given special treatment? No, these are just outstanding women, and it's great that women at the same time were able to succeed. Because what I don't believe is that a woman should ever be given preference uh, for being a woman. A woman should get the job, a woman should be hired, a woman should be promoted because she's the better candidate. And trust me, if you keep that funnel wide enough, so that's the problem most of the time, your entry point. You're looking for, for example, a vice president in a company. You have an external recruiter. You tell the recruiter, please send me some CVs. Guess what? You get eight men CVs, you get two women CVs. And so you've got these two women who have to be so outstanding, they have to beat eight men. Or you'll get nine and one. So this is the starting point where we've got to change the way it works. You've got to tell the headhunter recruiter, I want 50-50. At least you're giving every woman an equal playing field, or rather you're giving five women an equal playing field to go against five men. And then you choose the best candidate. And you kind of apply that same principle at every level. I don't think that, you know, uh, that, the future is something that is specific to banking. I think the future has to be across all industries. The focus has to stay in some of what we've already discussed, and we have to get very, very focused in our practices at a corporate level about what we can do. So when you focus on hiring and say, I want to change the diversity ratio of India, and I'm going to make sure out of every 100 hires, 60 are women and we succeeded in doing something like that, right? Simply because we opened that funnel so wide at the start that you were able to find something, you know, women who were that capable and of that caliber. The second big thing is, and I think Shafali talked about is, uh, you hired the women, you've got the women in, how do you retain them? And how do you make sure that they aren't the ones who whenever there's crisis like COVID, we've just gone through a pandemic, it's always the women who say, I've got to stay home now because I have an aging parent. I've got to stay home now because my kids' schools are closed and I don't know what to do. There are statistics. There is a report that was you know, done by, I think, Deloitte as well as by LinkedIn of the number of people who left the workforce in COVID. There were 40% more women who left the workforce than men. And now when you're going out and doing a survey, the women are 20% less willing to come back to work than men. So that's what something like COVID does, as it is a declining trend, and now you get into a pandemic where women have left the workforce or taken you know, a step back from being in office every day, and now to bring them back is even tougher because the world changed. So the way forward for every company has to become about your hiring practices, your retention practices, what do you want to do to make it easier for a woman to work. When women need their maternity leave, and now the you know the law of the land is that they get six months, when they come back, should they be offered things like, oh, you can come and work for half day, the flexibility of you know working, the flexibility of child care. Can companies start working with child care providers, creches, you know, daycare centers? Can they give that accessibility to women? There are a lot of women who can pay for it. We just don't know where to find them, right? When I was growing up, guess who brought up my, I mean, when my son was growing up, guess who brought him up? Dadi, Nani, and two maids. Because either Dadi had to be there or Nani had to be there. I was too scared to leave him just with, you know, a housekeeper. Right. And so that's what most of us have done. We've taken advantage of our extended and, uh, you know, joint family system in India. And the grandmothers were only too happy with the result. My son, even at 23, is, adores his Dadi, and I love it. Uh, because there was no trustworthy, credible enough child care system that I could turn to and say, I'm very comfortable leaving my two year old here 
from nine in the morning to six in the evening, which are the minimum hours I'll work. And then I joined an industry called BPO. So then I had no hours, right? So how, how do you provide women the, and that then comes in that last, you know, socio, socioeconomic kind of support that you need to provide. It's a pillar in itself. What's the infrastructure like? What's the safety like for a woman to go back from office at eight o'clock at night? How can we help that? So there's so many things we need to do in the journey and we need to do as companies and we need to do as a society to be able to help women get into the workforce, survive in the workforce, and then succeed. And all these conversations are going to help build great leaders, you know, create, develop. We lose Anjali's voice. Yeah, Miss Anjali, we can't hear you now. We lost your voice, Anjali. I think you're on mute. No, now you're back. Oh, you lost me, is it? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Just, just, the last, just the last 10 seconds. Oh, I'm so sorry. I was just saying that for therefore it's not just about, you know, the whole, um, the whole, uh, so you've got to hire the women, you've got to retain the women, you've got to create a socio economic and infrastructure for the women to be able to stay security, right? We, we don't live in a very secure country. Unfortunately for women, I come from NCR Delhi. Uh, I don't think even today women would be too comfortable driving around alone at night after 839 and it's dark and it's a cold foggy winter night. You have to work late in office. So how do you make sure that you're providing that kind of security? How does infrastructure change? How does child care change? I think those are the things it's not banking. Every company has to think of corporate India or, you know, should be thinking of that if we want really want women to be supported through their career, these are the things that must be set up in the entire environment for women to feel safe, secure, not worry, go through their childcare, go and be able to occasionally work very late hours in office and not worry about is, you know, how am I going to get home or it's getting dark outside or if the woman isn't worried, a mother-in-law or a husband at home is worried and it's the nature of, you know, the the cities we live in sometimes, they, they aren't safe enough. When I reach another city and I've been married almost, it will be how many years this year? It will be 28 years this year. My husband still tells me, send me the taxi driver's number, the car number. So whoever's coming to be with me, like I'm in Pune, right, today, I landed. It is done even today. Because is my husband 100% secure that everything okay? You're gonna land in a strange city, some strange taxi driver, or you know, a office taxi is gonna be with you. He'll still ask for those things, and so those are all the things I think we need to make better in our entire you know society. The whole infrastructure around us also has to change as we go forward. Thanks. Okay. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I always say this when, when we are talking to uh, younger women in our office, or let's say even if we are mentoring uh, uh, students from my business school, sometimes we do as an alumni connect. I always say that be cognizant of the fact that women's careers are not linear like men. You don't go from point A to point B organically, right? Women's careers are adjusted to the life stages in their life. So organizations, families, children, bosses, everyone needs to understand that you will meander and navigate through different life stages. Children will not always be young. You know, you will have different caregiving responsibilities at different points in time, and they're always running parallel. So, so one size doesn't fit all. One prescription, one office policy doesn't work for everybody. You need to sort of tailor it according to the life stages that especially women in workforce face, you know. Uh, coming to you, Shipali, I, you know, I, I, I wanted to understand. You work for a work for a tech company like like mine, right? Which area in technology, for example, R and D or product development or marketing, sales, support, back office, do you see maximum participation from women? And and how can this particular thing be enhanced across the across the functions in your organization? What would be a prescription? Uh, let's say at a policy level that needs to be included so that women feel included and empowered and engaged in the technology sector, right? Te technology happens to be the fastest growing sector also and, and the one that employs maximum women also. You sure, know? sure, sure. Um, so a very, very pertinent question. Um, but before I answer that, I, I work for an organization called 
at Fibernet. We are in the business of providing broadband. Um, now, when you uh, we, we were in the business of providing wired broadband, so which basically means a lot of the workforce has to be on the field, uh, laying infrastructure and uh, you know going into customers' homes for installations, etc. Uh, so this is an industry which is considered as extremely male centric. Um, so 14 years back when we started the organization and uh, all of us joined, we challenged this thought right from the beginning. And uh, fortunately, we see in my company, we see women in uh, literally all the roles that you mentioned. Uh, we have teams across, we have had team, we have had uh, women uh, in the age group of 40s uh, doing field roles all exclusive women teams in a place like Vijavada as well, uh, which is completely, completely changed the mindset within the company because this was an experiment, but one, a very successful experiment. There was greater levels of discipline. There was get greater level of performance and it opened up the mind uh, of the people in the right from the beginning when we were a startup, we did these, uh, these experiments. So I think those really helped us. So we find women in sales, we find women in operations, technology, marketing, et cetera. But I also know that it's not the same uh, everywhere. And uh, we, are, we have been able to do it because we have worked really hard on it. But if I take a look at the applications that flow in, uh, most of the women tend to apply for roles in marketing, product development, and technology in that order. Um, uh, for sales, for uh, service functions, it's a lot less. So we have to work harder to get in the inflow of uh, candidates in these roles. Uh, it's a bit unfortunate because, uh, you know, as you rightly said, India, one of the research that I came across, I'm sorry, I'm not able to remember the source, uh, was that India, compared to most of the other countries, actually has the highest participation of women in STEM education. But the employment statistic does not resonate the same spirit. So obviously something is happening out here and uh, there's a lot of dropping out which is happening and some of the smartest people, we take a look at uh, you know the scores, the exam scores, it's most of the time the woman topping the charts, etc. We are losing out some of the smartest people uh, from uh, uh, you know getting into the workforce. And I, I think you know some of the points that we discussed in the beginning, uh, at, at a lot of it is attributed to that. Um, corporate India definitely has a big role to play. And um, I think a lot of the discussions and the initiatives and the awareness on the diversity, equity and inclusion that's happening is uh, in the right direction. Um, but I think people need to feel it in their bones, right? Uh, it's uh, something that has to be really, really internalized because a lot of lip service happens and a lot of uh, people do it because it is mandated. Although that also has a place because you know, sometimes when you mandate certain rules, uh, you see the value in it after a while and then it becomes internalized. But I think it needs to, people need to feel it in their bones. And uh, uh, so I think at a policy level, if you ask me, uh, diversity should not be a, see, a nice practice alone. I think it must be mandated. Um, let me explain, uh, let me take a minute and explain why. Um, there's a concept called majority blindness. Uh, you know, I, recently I gave an interview in uh, uh, the, one of my interview got published in Economic Times and my brother read it and uh, he called me and he said that I mentioned patriarchy that I experienced while growing up. And he said, hey, our family wasn't like that. You know, uh, I said, uh, OK, you did not see it. Then I gave him a couple of instances. You know, one of the example, very, very small example was that um, that he used to get the best portion of, you know, something that mom made. Not that I did not get the food, but I got it. But the first preference went to him. It's tiny thing, but as a child, it, be, it, it was such a big thing. It's not that I didn't have the same opportunities I had, but that small act stayed in my mind. And when I discussed it, discussed it with him, he apologized profusely. And I had to tell him that it's not your fault. It's it's the blindness that comes when you don't face, um, you know, these micro discriminations. And uh, I don't blame him. He had the privilege. He was not experiencing the frustration of a stereotype that I was. 
So I think this has very, very deep implication. Uh, you know, when we are talking at an industry level, at an organization level, at a country level, because when we are at, when we are the majority, uh, we don't notice the discrimination minorities go through. Some of us might not notice as women as well. We might not notice, uh, let's say the discrimination, somebody from an LGBTQ uh, community goes through, right? Uh, when we are privileged, we don't notice the uh, experiences or the pain of the underprivileged. Uh, People like some of us who are in senior positions, we, if we don't work at it, we might not notice we are in position of power, but if we don't work at it, we might not even notice the struggles, you know, people who are junior in the organization go through, right? Uh, we may be blindsided and this is extremely important and hence diversity is something that should be made uh, mandatory because when the organization leadership is mostly male, the policies, the procedures, the perspectives would be from the male point of view, even if it is very empathetic to the woman, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and as uh, very rightly, uh, you know, uh, mentioned earlier, uh, the world is fifty percent men, fifty percent women. So I think the representation has to be uh, has to be um, uh, equal in at an institution level. Uh, from my business point of view, uh, for instance, our customers are not only male, right? We have broadband consumers, both male and female. So, uh, you know, if if we can serve them better, if our customers are diverse, having a diverse organization is only going to help. So there is a very strong correlation between diversity and performance. But I think we need to have these uncomfort uncomfortable uh, conversations. Some of the things that have really worked well, and I don't want to repeat. Um, I think Anjali had given a lot of examples, and those things have you know we've been practicing, and it really makes sense. For instance, at an infrastructure level, having creches, the childcare process, you know, childcare services, governesses in the office, so that people can come with the you know the kids, and they don't need to really miss out. Programs of allyship, mentoring, etc. But I think one thing that uh, we have uh, very recently started doing is awareness sessions for the uh, male population when it comes to gender. Of course, we are doing a lot of work on other areas of uh, discrimination and minority groups. So we are actually having these uncomfortable discussions about why should household chores be a woman's responsibility? Why is a woman trying to prove, why should a woman try to prove themselves equal to a man? Why we don't hear a man trying to prove himself being equal to a woman? Uh, you know, so these are implicit associations that we are trying, trying to break in the mind of the majority population that we have in our organization. So I think these conversations are extremely important. They help build up awareness. This get people into a reflective zone. Uh, of course, it has to be the entire ecosystem of things. It's it can't be just one or two things. It is systemic, as we had discussed earlier, it's family unit level. Women can play a very big role. Uh, schools have to play a big role. Uh, but I think um, uh, I think organizations can lead the way and we, we obviously, you know, at a certain level, we also need to have zero tolerance policies for any form of discrimination. It just makes organizations accountable and uh, you know does away with this concept called microaggression which are those tiny tiny things that we tend to ignore because it doesn't feel very big you feel like okay it was just a small joke so maybe i should just ignore it it was not big enough to but those microaggressions tend to play a very big role slowly and steadily in the psyche of a person so um yeah so i hope i've been able to answer your question uh, shipra yes, you have uh, coming to you, Ashwarya, I am, you know, I was just reading the economic sands today and the statistics were jumping out saying that we have a single woman CEO in 80 unicorns in the country, despite the noise in unicorns, uh, you know, uh, in, in entrepreneurship and only 20% of venture backed startups in India have at least only one female founder. And this is a report which came in 2020, I think a Sikosia capital report, keeping this, uh, uh, uh Keeping this as background and the and the quality of entrepreneurship in this country, uh, right? Uh, what do you think? What role do you see in in organizations promoting entrepreneurship, women entrepreneurship in India? Uh, you know, I, I I I remember you saying that you know your organization is is merit based, and that was one of the questions I had in my head. That when when we talk of promotion of entrepreneurship, do you earmark? Do you think that you're marking capital for only women to entrepreneurs could be a way or, uh, or a selection purely based on merit could be a way, right? 
Um, and, and the other thing that I was thinking was, and, and, and these are two questions that I'm rolling into one, but uh, at, while I'm at it, I also wanted to know what are the challenges you see in women coming forward and asking for capital. You know, I think when we're talking of biases and holding ourselves back, one of the biggest problem is that women don't ask for help. Women don't ask that this is what they want for the ecosystem to, you know, respond to it. How can women overcome the challenge of going and asking for help, asking for capital, asking for men mentorship, you know, given that you come from a, uh, from, from a uh, you know, financial background? Um, excellent questions. And uh, I, I think uh, I, I can at least answer them truthfully because uh, I work for an NBFC who's focused on lending to small and medium scale enterprises and also to women. And we are women led. So obviously that is part of a psyche, part of a core to try and focus on women population. Now to unpack your questions a little bit differently, uh, you asked me whether it's going to be merit based or women based. I would have to say both. Uh, let me start by saying that I would love for all the women to be assessed just on merit basis if they were given the chance. Now, the problem is, as I think Anjali mentioned, the pipeline, right? Even in the pipeline of sourcing, uh, like uh, employees in terms of pipeline of sourcing customers, what we see is women entrepreneurs don't come through in the pipeline itself, which means that even if I judge them on merit, I just have a measly two out of 10, the same ratio, in fact, worse in case of entrepreneurs to sort of judge and give the money. So um, if I put all of the women and men in an equal footing and judge them, I would love to give money just based on merit and logic, which is how it should be in terms of underwriting, in terms of capital, etc. But again, it comes to the problem of even finding these women entrepreneurs. In India today, I think less than 13% of businesses are women-owned, which is very, very small compared to the potential out there, compared to the ability of women who can run multiple businesses. And <clears throat> not to mention the fact that even uh, women are sort of, you know, uh, afraid to come in. So your question on what are the challenges, why don't women come forward? I think it's a combination of historical prejudice in terms of women uh, how can a woman run a business? Are you, uh, I mean, she is there at the home doing stuff. How can she run a business is the automatic mindset, unfortunately, which, which is still very rampant, not only in rural areas, but in urban India as well, which is fundamental. And secondly, even after the woman is able to come in, even she becomes an entrepreneur against all odds, gets to that point, access to capital remains a major challenge. So how do they access capital? Mostly in India, it's land or property collateral. And again, this goes to historically, I think somebody also mentioned that the property automatically goes to the sun, right? So where does women have any property to, you know, earmark so that they can go get the capital to run their business? So it's like a vicious circle. So um, in fact, in Kinara, uh, we try to break that bias we lend without land or property collateral and here we are equal whether it's a man or a woman we don't care if it's a good business having a good business plan and they are credit worthy customers then we are happy to lend to them which is breaking this bias of land or property collateral but having said that again when a woman comes in for funding again it's usually their first time trying to borrow which is, you know, in at least financial services term, it's called new to credit or first to credit, which again creates another problem to access any capital which uh, they need to start the business. So uh, the bias of women entrepreneurship is there at multiple levels. Uh, what women need to do is try to find a way to get the right mentorship to set up their entrepreneurship journey. They need the technical talent, the technical information to sort of come up to that level. And secondly, try and find funding which will support them through the journey. It is very, very, very important for women to climb back up to hold on to their vision because just because they are women, it doesn't mean that their entrepreneurial journey cannot become a reality, right? Uh, in terms of the credit gap, historically, uh, though women are more and more coming into the entrepreneurship journey, Highmark recently did a survey and what they have found out is women are 
better and more credit worthy than men. This is not to say that men are bad, but comparatively in terms of their credit track record, women, I think more than 45% women are having 730 above civil score, which is like fantastic, which means that it's just that if we break that bias, bring more women in, we'll see, I mean, what 80 unicorns, 800 unicorns soon enough with women at the top, which is what we should all gun for. I hope that answers your question, Shipra. Sorry, we can't absolutely. Yeah, absolutely it does. Uh, thank you for throwing light on it. Uh, and uh, Nidhi, I'll move to you with an interesting question. Uh, we're going to be up for time quickly, and I really want to ask this. Uh, uh, you know, what is the potential of spirituality at workplace? Does it enable uh, us to uh, face challenges more positively? Does it, uh, you, you know, does it lead to more self-awareness and unlearning of the mindset, you know, to, to tackle the biases that are available, both for men and women, both? Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Shipra. That was a lovely question, a question very close to me because we work on spirituality. What is the potential of spirituality? We must understand uh, spirituality is the very essence of our existence. Spirituality is not rigid like religion or uh, confining or limiting in nature. It's universal. So being non-sectarian is a uniting factor for humanity. I'll go a little technical here. So we are a combination of three gunas of nature, sattva, rajasva, and tamas. A balance of the three is needed. Just one of them will not be enough. Earth is a Rajasic planet. So when I say Rajasic planet, uh, the Rajogun uh, of the planet is that of comfort, uh, luxury, nurturing. Uh, it is consumeristic in nature. So are the aspirations of people and businesses. Sattva is that of truth and spirituality. So if you achieve Rajasva, which is the goal of humanity, through the root of sattva, that, this, that is the right me, while following the precepts of yogic teachings, which are again universal and not uh, related to a particular religion, the society becomes automatically harmonious, compassionate, equal and serviceful. We've talked enough about the problems. Yes, they are there. I'm not denying it. Now let us see what solutions can come. If we tackle the problem at the root level, then the problems don't reoccur. Naturally, everything becomes harmonious and uh, compassionate, not just gender equality. If we introduce a sattva trainings at uh, the primary level, school, colleges, we can achieve all those goals through good means. We need to achieve uh, rajasva, but through sattva and not through tamas. It will assist team spirit, compliance, job satisfaction. Tamas need not be taught. Humans automatically observe that from a bad company and, you know, um, from all our environment. So if we don't work on our sattva, we will automatically graviate towards tamas and rajasik nature. So uspe kaam karna humko bohat zaruri hai. Now, if we achieve rajasva, which is the goal of humanity, through tamasik, that is the unfair means, People become selfish, that uh, me first attitude, jo dekhte hai corporates mein, that egoistic, law-breaking attitude, that one upmanship seekers. That is uh, that happens because people try to achieve rajasva through tamas. We're trying to hear if if we actually achieve rajasva through um, the right means, that is sattva, we won't need trainings like Porsche anymore. Now how to implement this spirituality. Firstly, we must start teaching this at the elementary school level so that it becomes a part of their essential nature. It is not something that uh, they have to acquire. It is something that is within them. Japan has a very robust system. No wonder they have a great team spirit, right? Again, it should be, spirituality should be completely non-religious in nature, just like yoga. And uh, it's a commendable thing that our government has introduced a World Yoga Day, uh, highlighting the importance of a practice like yoga, which we had forgotten. Similarly, spirituality should also be completely non-religious in nature. 
again sensitizing the parents to provide children the uh, right atmosphere like shafali had mentioned uh, about uh, the very minute discrimination that she faced during childhood i have been through the same i i i didn't have a brother we were two sisters growing up and uh, my father never actually discriminated probably that is the reason why i am here today doing what i am doing i have been privileged i'll not deny that but uh, i know all of a lot of people who haven't got the right atmosphere right during their childhood and that is why they behave in a certain manner during their adulthood so sensitizing the parents is a very important step we can introduce it in college curriculums uh, especially do for the mba students for the uh, b ed students stressing more on ethics and morals we need to bring in more ethics morals uh, value based uh, education system rather than only skill based education system the leaders of tomorrow you know they should be able to see the success through the prism of spirituality spirituality ke through aap ek alag level of success achieve kar sakte hain a systematic and a uniform procedure should be laid out and implemented evenly it should be it should be for everyone it should uh, encourage inclusiveness we are you know we, we are living in a world of exclusiveness that me first attitude mera pehle kya baad mein dekhte hain dusron ka so it should have a you know common good for everyone an inclusive attitude rather than an, a me first attitude um there's a step by step process for it the first step is awareness so like uh, uh, we discussed earlier awareness is very important and which i already see so we have already kind of crossed the first step of awareness we know that there is a problem we are not denying it and how to tackle it is the next step so learning we should have the right knowledge if we had the right knowledge right from the beginning then it wouldn't have taken us so many years uh, to continue discussing the same topic so how to tackle the problem at the root level that is the learning that is the second step then the third step is implementation just learning just talking about it today today all of us are talking about it for an hour but how much are we or our audience going to implement it is what will make the actual difference and the fourth and the most important step is the feedback एक बार इम्प्लीमेंट कर दिया एंड देन वी फॉरगेट अबाउट इट नो वी वी हैव टेंडेंसीज टू टू गो बैक टू वेयर वी हैड स्टार्टेड फ्रॉम सो अ फीडबैक इज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट गुड एग्जांपल्स फ्रॉम सोसाइटी शुड बी वैलिडेटेड आई नो ऑफ अ लॉट ऑफ एग्जांपल ऑफ मेन हु हैव बीन सपोर्टिंग विमेन इन इन अ वेरी वेरी कॉन्शियस एंड इन इन अ वेरी सपोर्टिव मैनर इन इन अ मैनर दैट दे डोंट so there are men who do it just for the sake of uh, doing it but while there are some who actually feel that um, women need to get their due so such good example should be validated they should be applauded and they should even be monetarily in, uh, incentivized i at least i feel that way for me it was uh, very heartwarming to see lot of such examples being awarded by the government during these uh, recent padma awards uh, 2022 people from very humble backgrounds were duly recognized so we can take cue from such people and lead forward the nation well, rightly said uh, i would love to carry on this conversation for another one hour i think we we have still so much to talk about but in interest of time um i wanted to thank you all uh, for giving your time to the subject uh, we all agree that the importance of gender equality and diversity within and outside of the workplace is critical to build a better uh, more equal future for everybody right so corporates are getting this inclusion right with creating holistic environments that includes um, uh, unbiased hiring procedures you know diverse leadership styles uh, pay parity exercises and a general sensitization of the workforce um i i read today uh, in the morning that this year's international women's day theme is called break the bias i think you may be seeing uh, the whole uh, you know social media uh, everyone is doing this photograph it's called break the bias it's a it's a universal theme um the the website gives the explanation such as it's a world free of bias stereotype and discrimination a world that is diverse equitable and inclusive i think something that all of us here on the screen totally believe in um i'm going to end this with one of my favorite quotes uh, again from uh, sheryl sandberg where she says that we need women at all levels 
including at the top, to change the dynamic, to reshape the conversation, and to make sure that women's voices are heard and heeded and not overlooked and ignored. So uh, let us all raise our voices in unison and keep the conversation and action going. Thank you very much, all of you, for, for your time today. And um, I, I hope all of us collectively can move the needle in some way with, uh, with our own organizations, our families, our communities. Have a fantastic day ahead, and thank you once again for your time. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you very much. We can sign out, right? Yes, ma'am. Uh